So welcome to today's lecture, which is part two of the lecture on image histograms. And today we want to look into transformations of images and what's the impact on the resulting histograms. Uh, we started with this in the first part of this lecture and now we want to dive a little bit deeper and actually investigate how can we actually design those transformation functions which map an input image into an output image so that the histogram of the output image has certain properties. And we will specifically look into two techniques here. The one is called histogram equalization and the second one is noise variance equalization. So what histogram equalization does, it basically takes all the intensity values that we have in our image and distribute them uniformly over the range of intensity values, typically ranging from 0 to 255. And the second technique, noise variance equalization, um, modifies the image in a way that the uncertainty of about the intensity value of every pixel measurement is the same. That means every pixel has the same uncertainty about the measured intensity, which is not the case for a standard camera. This comes especially important if you do a statistical image analysis, um, which involves the intensity values of your image, and you want to make the assumption in your algorithm that all measurements have the same noise characteristics. Um, that simplifies um, typically a lot of things, and therefore it's quite useful to do this transformation to actually ensure that this is the case. Okay, so let's start. Let's briefly repeat what is an image histogram. So an image histogram is um, um, a distribution, which is kind of illustrated over here, and basically it tells me how often do individual intensity values occur. So here on the x-axis we have the possible intensity values ranging from 0 to 255 typically, and um, on the y-axis we have the occurrences, so the counts. So it basically says there's a pixel with an intensity value of 0, which is a black pixel, and it occurs five times, which if I look to my image, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is the case over here. The same holds for gray and for white pixels, so that any arbitrary image as my input, like this 3x3 three three toy example, can be mapped into a histogram which looks like this, which typically has 256 bins. Um, depending on the resolution of your camera, um, the, you may have more intensity values over here. But in the simplest form, we typically have 256, so 8 bits available for our individual intensity values. And we can compute those histograms from arbitrary images. So just as an example, I have here a arbitrary input image and um, I can generate that histogram. How we do that is we basically go over all pixels, check the intensity value and increase the corresponding count in my histogram by one. And that's it. I just need to inspect every pixel once and increase the count. So an operation which is fairly easy to do. And the histogram tells us something about the image. So if you look to this histogram, for example, we see this peak of kind of dark values over here. And this actually corresponds to this area in this image. So it's a rather uniform area where, um, which is pretty dark, and this causes this peak over here. And then the remaining intensity values from something like whatever, 50 to 230, for example, they span more or less equally over the image. So they all occur roughly the same amount of time because it's a roughly uniform distribution over here. And this is kind of the whole structure of the, of, of the CAD itself. And this is something that we can compute very easily for every image. And then the question is, um, what happens if I transform the image? What happens if I change intensity values in this image? And what happens depends on the function I use, obviously, to um, perform this transformation. So, um, and the, this function typically changes also the histogram because it changes the intensity values. What we can see is if we have a transformation function which changes the mean intensity value or the mean of the histogram, which is um, identical in this case, so that means taking this histogram and shifting it here to the right hand side, this will make the image brighter. And if we change the variance um, of the intensity values, so for example increasing the variance, meaning having higher spread of intensity values over the possible spectrum, this increases the contrast. And this is an example which is shown here. Here the intensity values range from zero to something like whatever, 220 maybe, and we stretch it to the full spectrum and even have, a, have some oversaturation over here, then we can see this has increased the contrast of that image. So by changing, um, by using a transformation function f that maps one image into the other image, we can see based on the, how it changes the histogram, if this, for example, changes brightness, contrast, computes the negative of the image, um, or, and so on and so forth. And this is the transformation function. And today, we want to look into those transformation functions. We want to understand those transformation functions better and want to get an idea on how we can actually design transformation functions so that our resulting image has certain properties. 
So before um, we start with actually designing F, we first need to understand the process a bit further. And I want to start with the first question is, um, can we actually compute the output histogram only knowing the transformation function and obviously input histogram, but not knowing the input image itself? So can we actually estimate how the function F will change the histogram um, just by knowing the, uh, the histogram of the function F? And it will turn out, yes, this will be the case. And doing this will help us understand how, what's the relationship between input image, output image, and F, so that later on we can impose constraints on the output image, and as a result of this, design our function F, so that it achieves the desired um, output properties. Okay, so let's start. Um, we want to restrict ourselves to the monotonous function F, so that means it's increasing from um, zero to 255. Um, so we don't want to, for example, compute the negative of an image, which would be a monotonously decreasing function. Or actually, it could be a decreasing function, but we don't want to move it up and down. But in most of the cases, this will be a monotonously increasing function. Um, so a monotonous function is what we assume. So we have our input intensity value A, which will be mapped to an output intensity value B. Um, with HA, um, is this refers, HA refers to the histogram of the input image, and A is the input intensity value for which I query it. And the output histogram is H of B, which I query with an output value B. And HB is computed from HA through the transformation function F. So I'm taking all the, um, the intensity values for my image A, squeeze it through F, and this allows me then to generate my output histogram. And based on how this transformation looks like, I will gain some knowledge about this function f, um, which then helps me to design customized functions f so that certain properties hold. Okay, what we want to do now is we want to look into this mapping. So how this histogram HA is mapped into the histogram HB through this function f. And for that, it's quite useful to have these types of graphs. So, what we can see over here, we have one axis over here, another axis over here. And these are the intensity values in my input. And these are the intensity values in my output. So A and B. What I then plotted here is the input distribution. So my input histogram, H A of A, which is plotted over here. And it's just kind of, actually I would, I would actually plot it like this in the positive sense. I just flipped it around so it's easier for the visualization. So this is, our, is my distribution of intensity values um, in my input image A. This function over here is my function F, so my tone curve or my function which transforms one, the input image into the output image. That's my function F. What I plot over here is the output histogram. So the thing I don't know, which I would like to compute. So this is HB, so that's what I want to compute. So this is given, this is given, and this is what I want to compute. And um, why is this, um, this representation or this illustration here useful? Because I can take any point on my input distribution curve, like this one over here, squeeze it to the function f, so a becomes the x value of this function f, and will be mapped to the y value of that function f, so the output, that means it will generate this point here on the output histogram. Okay? So I can actually do this mapping from here to there, so these intensity values will be mapped to those values, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of why this is a kind of attractive representation. Because what I can do right now, I can say, okay, how many intensity values do I have that fall within a certain range? Let's say this is a value 150, for example. And I say, well, how many, how many grayscale values fall into the, um, have intensity values between 150 and 155, for example? So this would be this area. DA would be then five pixels, uh, five intensity values, sorry. And then, this value over here, this area, represents, um, if you think about a probability distribution, it, uh, it represents the probability mass that we have pixel intensities that fall into this range 150 to 155. Um, or if it's a non-normalized histogram, it's just the count. So we'll just, just get out how this area corresponds to how many pixels have grayscale values between 150 and 155. Okay, so I know that all those gray values over here will be mapped over there. This one will be mapped over there. This one will be mapped over there. So I know the number of pixels in this gray area must be identical with the gray area over here because it's the same number of pixels. No pixel is lost. We just take pixels and change the intensity values 
but I know that all the intensity values which fall into this area here must sit in this area over there. And that's the reason why this is a monotonous function and doesn't, can, couldn't be a sine function over this because then it would be much more complicated to do. Okay, so that is the key thing that this area over here and this area over here must be the same because we are not losing any pixel. We are just changing intensity value from an input to an output and this range, it should stay in the same range. And so as a result of this, I can see this if I would kind of integrate over this function and this is my integration interval, then the integral over this function, this interval, and the integral over this function within this interval must be identical, right? So there's kind of a constraint that we can then, uh, then use later on. And this is a key insight that this area must be identical and this allows me uh, to tell, to estimate how this function f will change the histogram and will later on allow me to design functions f so that we obtain certain properties. Okay, so let's write that down. So within this kind of gray area, there's the interval from a to a plus dA, so this is this area over here, and the interval b plus dB, which is this area over here. Those areas, so the, uh, th for this value times this value and this value times this value over here must be identical. So basically the integral, this areas must be identical. Okay, assuming that this function doesn't change too much, um, and we can just approximate this by either the first value over here or the, the mean value of those intensities over here. We can say that the histogram value of the intensity value B, so H, the output histogram value B, so this is this one over here, times dB, this value over here, so basically this value times this value, must be identical to this value over here times this value over here, okay? So this is basically, this is a constraint which says the area stays the same. And this is a constraint that we now can use in order to, um, you know, to derive those properties. Of course, D, B and DA should be, should be as small as possible so that the mistake that I'm just taking one intensity value out of the histogram um, doesn't have a big impact. So we're talking about small areas over here. So if we now simply um, take the equation here from our previous slide, just to copy and paste, um, then, and we want to generate a function that um, depends on HB. So our goal is to have the output histogram HB equals something. That's what kind of function that we want to, uh, want to specify. And we can see we have HB here on the left-hand side and some other terms in here. So in order to have an equation which says HB equals something, I can simply divide by DB. So I can divide by DB, so that I'll obtain this equation over here. And I put the, um, the absolute value over here because I'm, I clearly want to ignore if it's a monotonously increasing or decreasing function. If it would be a decreasing function, then um, dB would be negative. And as a result of this, I would have a negative area over here, which is something I don't want. So I use the absolute value over here. Okay? So this has been just rewriting this one over here. So now let's have a look. What means dB divided by dA? So this is kind of this value, dB divided by dA over here. So it tells me something about this function. And it's actually the definition of the slope of this function in this point over here. So this value down here describes the slope of this function here at that point. So basically a linear approximation of this function f between those two points over here. And this is nothing else than the first derivative of this function f. So the value down here actually represents the first derivative of my function f. So I can just write it as being the first derivative of my function f because it's the slope of this function here at that point, approximated through those lines going through those two points over here, which is my first derivative. Okay, that's good. What I have now is I have hb, which is what I want to have. So an equation where this is left-hand side, and then some elements on the right-hand side. ha is my input histogram, which I know, f is my transformation function, which I assume to be given, so I can also compute its first derivative, or at least we assume we can compute the first derivative of this function. Um, that looks good. The problem, or the only problem that I have, the argument here of that histogram is a value called b, and this value b doesn't pop up here anymore. It's kind of hidden in this a, because we know that through this function f, a will be turned into b, but there's no argument b in here, so that I can easily specify this function. So, um, this function that I want to specify should depend on B and not on A. 
So what I need to do is I need to write down the relationship how A is mapped into B and then invert this and put it into this equation. And that's actually fairly easy because we know what B is. B is nothing else than F of A. So B equals F of A. And as a result of this, we can say A equals F inverse of B. So the inverse of my function F. This assumes that I can invert my function F. And at this point in time, we can exploit the property that this function was monotonically increasing or decreasing. So as a result of this, this um, function f, we can specify this function f over here. So um, we now have a equals f inverse of b. So we can replace this a over here with this f inverse of b. Because then the only parameter we have in there is this b, which was the input to our function over here. So we can just take this one, put it into this equation, so that we obtain the resulting equation. The output histogram can be specified through the input histogram, the inverse of my transformation function, and the first derivative of the transformation function and the inverse of the transformation functions. These are the elements which play a role. So this means just by knowing the input histogram A, by knowing the transformation function and by being able to compute the first derivative of this transformation function, I can specify how the output histogram looks like. That means knowing this one and knowing this one, we can actually compute the output histogram over here. Okay? So, and that's a key insight. That's something that we will exploit in order to design Fs if you want to impose certain constraints on HP later on. So let's start with a very simple example for this function f. Let's assume we have an arbitrary input histogram HA and this function f is a linear function. So this is just an example. We, we're not constrained to linear functions. We're only constrained to monotonous functions. Uh, so a function is only increasing or decreasing. So if we have now a linear function in its simple form, uh, let's say f of a is k plus m times a. So we have our constant term and a scale factor over here in front of A. So this was the, we were the simple linear function that we have been discussing in the previous lecture. Use them just as an example over here. Um, then it's clear that we can compute the first derivative of this function with respect to A. So it's easy, this part doesn't depend on A. This is a linear dependency on A. So the first derivative of this function is simply M. So the first derivative of F is M. It's a constant because it's a linear function. So we have constant slope. The slope is not changing over this function. Okay, and we can of course easily compute an inverse of a linear function. Um, so if my function is k plus m times a, then its inverse is b minus k divided by m. You can see this quite easily um, how that works. We have the output value over here. We basically need to shift it by k because that's what we added before. And then we need to scale it with 1 divided by m because this one had been scaled by m. So just to invert it, if we scale by m and then by 1 divided by m, we scale it with the identity with 1. And if we shift k to the right and then shift k to the left, we basically invert that mapping that we did before. So for this linear function, this is the first derivative and this is the inverse of that function. And now I can put this all into our equation. So this is just a copy paste from the equation in the previous slide. And then if I put in those numbers, this is the result that I will get. So the only thing I need to know, I need to query basically the individual values of my input histogram, where the value is b, so the intensity value I want to know, minus k divided by m, and divide the overall value again by the absolute value of m. And this gives me the intensity value of my output histogram. So my output histogram is fully computed. So this means we can directly compute the output histogram just knowing the input histogram and my transformation function um, f. In the linear case of a linear function, it looks exactly like this. And basically corresponds to shifting by k, uh, scaling by uh, 1 divided by m, and in this case, obtain my corresponding intensity values. Okay, so what we have done now in this first part, we have explained how we can compute an output histogram given an input histogram and this transfer for function f, transfer function f. What we now want to do, um, we want to use this information in order to design a function f, so moving away from this linear function over here, um, and um, so that this, the output histogram has certain properties. So the key question to answer is, can we design, or in which way can we design transformations, so this function f, such that the resulting 
image or the histogram of the resulting image has certain desired properties. And there are different constraints that I can impose and depending on the constraints that I'm imposing, uh, this procedure will look differently. And I wanna go into two examples over here and explain important transformations of those um, histograms. I wanna start with histogram equalization. So histogram equalization is a technique which basically takes all the intensity values in an image and rearranges them so that all bins of this histogram are equally used in the output image. So it basically means we are rearranging intensity values so that we have a uniform usage of intensity values over the whole image. And again, this is in a monotonous function increasing or decreasing, typically an increasing function in most cases. Um, and the question is how do we actually design this function f so that we obtain those properties? The first thing is you may ask yourself why is this actually needed? And so this is an example here from uh, one of our research activities which is um, localization using camera images under extreme weather conditions, for example, or under extreme seasonal changes. And you can see over here that it's actually pretty hard to see any structure in this dark image taken uh, by a through a drive through a city through Kiev in this example. And if I perform a histogram equalization and take the intensity values and um, spread those intensity values uniformly over the spectrum of possible values, this will look better. And the reason for this is you can see we have a lot of dark pixels over here, also over here, a lot of bright pixels over here, and very little structure that we can actually see in this image. And by taking those intensity values and spreading those intensity values over the image, um, over the full range of possible values, we actually get an image where we can um, see much more of the structure. So you can see, at least visually now, uh, much more structure in these before very bright areas. And this allows us, for example, through this kind of normalization, to better match those images against other images which have been taken under uh, different weather conditions, for example. Um, okay, so that's kind of the idea behind this histogram equalization. So shifting intensity values around so that the full spectrum of intensity values is equally used. Okay, so let's look into an example. We have an input image, like this photograph of a landscape over here. And if we look to the histogram of intensity values, we can see basically most of the intensity values um, occur somewhere between, let's say, 110 and 200. So these are the so my histogram and what this function f, uh, this black function here is the cumulative histogram. So no, no intensity values up to this point, then the function increase and all intensity values are basically smaller than 200. So the red one is the histogram, the black one is the cumulative histogram. And I wanna turn this image into another image so that also all those values in here and all those values in here are used and also of, still, of course, all the values in the middle and all should be used kind of equally. It will not be a perfect match that all are equally used based through to discretization errors, but roughly I wanna have a uniform use of intensity values of the whole image. In, uh, if I execute this histogram normalization, um, then I will obtain this output image so that the full range of intensity values is used from white to complete black and all the intensity values happen, uh, occur with the same probability. So, in this image, it's the same probability of seeing a black pixel or seeing a white pixel or seeing any gray pixel over here. So this is the property that this image has. And um, the question is, how can I define a transformation function that maps this image into this image so that this property of a uniform use of intensity values actually holds? And this is what the histogram equalization does. So again, if you go back to the plots that we've seen before, if this is our input histogram, our output histogram, this one over here, should be a uniform distribution. So from this shape, which is kind of, let's say, roughly a Gaussian distribution, at least uh, roughly, we will want to turn it into a uniform distribution where all intensity values occur with the same probability. So we need to design this function f, so this is the function that we want to find, so that this actually holds. And what you can see here, again, we have the same constraint that this area over here must be identical to this area over here, this area over here must be identical to this area over here, and this area should be identical to this area over here. So these are the constraints that still apply for all mappings from the input histogram to the output histogram. And again, the constraint that we are imposing is that HB of B should be constant. So 
this is a constant function. At least if this function would be continuous, this should be our result. Um, to be honest, we're living in a non-continuous world and therefore we will make discretization errors due to the only 256 um, intensity values which we can use. That this will not be a perfect uniform distribution, but we want to come as close as possible. Okay, let's again exploit this constraint that these areas should be the same in order to, um, you know, to come up with a, with a proper mapping. So the first thing we use is this equation over here that we used before. So h of b is h of a divided by db by, divided by dA. And we are now looking only into increasing functions f, so we know that this ratio is always positive, so I can get rid of the absolute value that I was introducing before. Okay, so this is basically the knowledge that we already used before. And the only constraint that we want to impose is here that the, every value of my output histogram should be a constant. Let's call that constant k. So this constant k, value k is the, is the constraint that I actually want to impose. So I know that this right-hand side must be equal to k. Right? This is the, impose, the constraint that I'm now imposing. So I say k must be equal to h a of a divided by d b divided by d a. So that's my constraint that I have right now. So what I can now do, I can actually um, rearrange this equation a little bit to move db to one side. So I can say db over here, so I basically multiply by db and divide by k. So db equals 1 divided by k, the input histogram times dA. And again, my dBs and dAs are kind of small increments of intensity values on the input spectrum and on the output spectrum. So the question is now, how do we solve this in order to obtain um, the, the, the relationships or so the parameters of that function f so that we obtain uh, the desired properties? So how the histogram A is mapped into the histogram B, or image A is mapped into image B. So we can solve this equation by an integration. So by integrating over the values db, dA on both sides, we, as we'll see in a second, we can obtain an equation that allows us to provide this transformation function. So basically put an integral over here and put an integral over here on both sides. So integral over the output intensity values and the integral over the, uh, integral over the input intensity values. Because we knew this basically holds for all small fractions, so it will also hold for the histogram. So what we here have basically is a constant function, a constant, a constant function, a function of one which is integrated. And here the integration uh, may be slightly more complicated because we have this histogram of A sitting in here of which we need to integrate. So integrating this part is easy. This just turns into B. If you have a constant, you perform your integration, you basically get your integration variable in there, plus an integration constant C1. Okay. So because if you, want to comp if you compute the first derivative of this function, c goes away and b turns into 1, which is exactly the constant function that I have in here. Basically, imagine this as a 1 over there. On the right-hand side, I can move 1 divided by k out of the integration because k is independent of a. So I may then have the integral over my histogram uh, of the individual intensity values. And now if you think back about the last lecture we were talking about, if I have a histogram, I can commute very easily the cumulative histogram, right? The cumulative histogram is nothing else than this integration over here. So this is the integral over the histogram of intensity values, something that we call um, upper scale H, H of A, which is the intensity value or the, the sum of intensity values used from zero up to A, right? And so this is something which comes from this integration over here. And that's something we can easily compute. We just need to sum up for every bin the, uh, the values of, of all bins smaller or equal to that value in our input histogram. So something we have briefly discussed in the first part of this lecture. Okay, so that's good. So we can replace this by uppercase h of a by the cumulative histogram. So the original equation that I had simplifies to this equation over here. So again, Let's just copy paste from what we said before. This is one divided by k, this was a constant factor. This is my h a of a and we have our second integration constant. What I now can do is I can simply combine those integration constant c1 and c2 
into, um, into one constant by just kind of subtracting C1 here. So I would have minus C1 sitting over here and can replace C2 minus C1 by a new integration constant called C. So as a result of this, B, my output intensity value, equals to F of A, my input intensity value transformed, which is equal to one divided by K, the commutative histogram of A plus C. Great. With this, I have defined my transformation function or derived my transformation function um, that performs this mapping. The only thing which I don't know at that moment is what is K and what is C, which are two constants. So two constants that I now need to further specify and I can Im impose further constraints um, based on the output histogram, how to determine C and how to determine K so that I can fully describe this function F. Let's have a look how this looks like. So we have the parameters k and c that we want to that we need to specify, and what we want to what we can now want to exploit in order to determine c and k is that the constraint that all intensity values are equally used. So what's the smallest possible intensity value and what's the largest possible intensity value? The smallest possible intensity value is zero, and the largest possible intensity value is 255. So what we now want to do is that zero, as given that f is a in monotonously increasing function, we want to say that f of zero should be mapped to zero and f of 255 should be mapped to 255. That means pure black, pitch black, will be mapped to pitch black and pure white will be mapped to pure white. So these are basically the anchoring points at the end of those histograms, right? Which makes sense if I have a function which is monotonously increasing, the smallest value should stay the smallest value and the maximum value should stay the maximum value. But in between, something else may happen. So I can now use those, um, those two constraints to actually determine how C and K do look like. So, and um, as a result of this, what you can see is that if, if you apply that is that you have your input histogram that we had before from our example image, and this should be mapped into the output histogram which looks like this. So you can see now that the full spectrum is used. So this the highest intensity value will be mapped to, to the largest value and this one also to the smallest value. That means all the values in between should be mapped to zero and all the values here should be mapped to the maximum value. So all the ranges from zero to whatever, something like 120 over here, will be all mapped to black and all the values from around 200 to 255 will be mapped into the largest bin, 255. Right? So because there was no lower or higher intensity value in the original histogram, so we can all combine them into pitch black or pure white. And all the values in between over here will be mapped to the full range of possible intensity values of the histogram. And this is kind of the constraint that I'm imposing here, that the largest, the smallest value should be zero and the largest value should be zero, so that means everything which sits here in between um, will be moved to the, to the overall spectrum of, uh, of intensity values. So these are kind of the constraints or an illustration of the constraints that I'm actually exploiting over here. So let's see how those two equations actually do change um, how that function looks like. Okay, so we choose, we want to choose the parameters k and c in a way that f of 0 is 0 and f of 25 is 255. And I have my equation um, from my, from my original equation, I can just put in those values. So this was is f of zero, and this is zero. This is f of 255, and this is 255. Okay, so I say one divided by k, um, the cumulative histogram of the smallest bin, plus a constant, the integration constant must be zero. And here I can say one divided by k of h of the maximum value, plus the integration constant should be 255. And this h of 255, if you remember, is the, the maximum value of the cumulative histogram, which is not normalized, is the number of pixels in my image. Because the cumulative histogram tells me what are the number of pixels which have an intensity value smaller or equal to the input value. So h of the maximum intensity value will basically return the overall number of pixels because all pixels in my image have an intensity value smaller or equal than the maximum value of 255. Okay, so then I can very easily um, and exploit those, the, the properties over here, combining those two functions and get up the equation that k must be n the number of pixels minus the basically number of pixels in the first bin divided by 255 and my integration constant is um, 
the negative of the value of the first spin of my histogram, 255, and then again this uh, same value that I have here, the number of pixels um, minus the number, uh, the, the number of pixels in the first spin. And then I can now specify my final function using my integration constant C and my scale factor K to come up with my final expression, how f looks like, which sits over here. I have the rounding operation here because I basically need to round to, or the rounding or the quantization of intensity values between um, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 255. I only have integer values or only allow for integer values over here. And therefore, we have this rounding operation sitting in here. So with a very simple function, we can perform this histogram equalization. So that my input image shown over here with the histogram and the cumulative histogram is mapped into this output histogram and this corresponding output image. So you may ask yourself now if you look to this output histogram, wait a moment, we had the constraint that all the intensity values should be equally used. This is not an equal distribution. So why is this not a, a uniform distribution, not equal values everywhere? Hmm. Let's see how that looks like if you go to a different image. Maybe it looks better there. Let's go to our cat image before. This was our input histogram. And we now want to stretch this histogram that we get a uniform distribution over all those values over here. If you look to this, we actually see, hmm, not really a uniform distribution as well. What happened? What was our mistake that this is not the case? And this is a result of our quantization of the intensity value or discretization errors that we are, that we are doing over here. So let's look to the perfect world, the perfect continuous world. This was our input histogram. This was our flat output histogram. And um, we have those values, so all the intensity values which sit here under that curve, we map to this value, right? So this was our constraint in the perfect, ideal, continuous world. The problem is our input world is not continuous. Our input intensity values are 256 different discrete values. They come from the quantization of the photon counts, basically, that we put into certain buckets. So we can't generate arbitrarily flat output histograms because the minimum thing we could do is one single intensity value. This holds for the output, but also for the input. We can't get smaller um, than one intensity value. So whatever is the intensity value 100, for example, can't be split up in two intensity values to 99 and 100, for example. That's not going to work. They are all the same. They're all equally treated. So they will all be mapped to either 99 or 100, for example. So we can't get arbitrarily small integrals, uh, in intervals over here. We are constrained to the, to the interval of one single grayscale value. And at least if we have only our 256 different intensity values, this will be a problem. This may be different if your original image here had a higher range of intensity values, let's say using not 8 bits but 16 bits, and you map it down to an uh, 8 bit image, then you will get a much better uniform distribution. But um, if you go back, for example, over here to our example, what you can see is if you take buckets which are a little bit larger so that multiple intensity values fall in here and you sum up over all the intensity values which are in here, then you would actually get a uniform distribution. You can see it if you look to the cumulative histogram. For a uniform distribution, the cumulative histogram should be one straight line. Right? And this is not a straight line, but it's a step function. And the step function is the result of these discretization errors. So if I could make those bins smaller, if I would have kind of a higher resolution of intensity values over here, not just kind of whatever, 80 values over here, but much more, then I could actually spread them better over the histogram and this would be a perfect straight line and this would be a perfect uniform distribution. But if I have the same resolution in input and output and haven't used the full spectrum of intensity values, I will only be able to do this up to discretization error. Okay, so histogram equalization, which does this, maps this image into this image, um, what it typically does, in general, it increases the contrast of the image because it increases the variance, the spread of possible intensity values over my image because it basically puts um, a uniform distribution of intensity values over all 
in, in all possible grayscale values. Um, so it typically increases um, the areas which have low contrast will gain a higher contrast. So for example, here in these areas of the field, they turn actually in rather contrastive areas over here. So especially in very bright areas, you increase the contrast and it does this by redistributing intensity values over the histogram, over the whole spectrum of possible input values. You can also look to another example. So this was our original cat example. This was our input histogram. In this case, the, uh, the function f to generate the, um, no, sorry, this is the cumulative histogram over here. So we have no fully black, purely black values, and then we have a large number of those dark values, and then it's more or less a straight line because this is already more or less a uniform distribution. Not perfectly, but roughly. And then we have just a very small number of values sitting in the high end of the spectrum. So this is the, um, the cumulative histogram. So, and then I can actually compute the mapping function, which in this case actually looks quite similar to the cumulative histogram, is not identical, but um, looks similar, which maps our um, input intensity values, which are sitting over here, into my output intensity values. So that the histogram that I'm actually generating, again, has very high values over here, but you can see um, it spread them over higher intensity values. And um, if you would integrate over small regions over here, over multiple bins, this would actually turn into a uh, approximately uniform distribution. So from our input image, we get our equalized image, and you can see slight contrast in increase. I hope you can see it in the video uh, between those two images over here, especially, for example, here in the areas um, of, of high intensity values. You can see here a nice um, increase in contrast of the image. So this was standard histogram equalization with the goal of unifying um, the, uh, not unifying, but you're generating a uniform spread of intensity values over the image. It should be noted that there are different variants of this uh, histogram equalization. So what we have shown here was a standard histogram equalization. What's also very popular is something that's called adaptive histogram equalization, where you don't treat the whole image um, for the normalization, but for every local um, normalization you do, you basically take a neighborhood into account and then basically perform histogram equalization on local patches, not taking into account the whole image to get a kind of a better distribution. Um, that works actually fairly well and has been used, for example, in order to change uh, images, how they're displayed on displays. Uh, for example, uh, for pilots, you know, to get a better view for the pilots so they can better see things. The problem with the adaptive histogram equalization, however, is, is that if you have very uniform areas, uh, let's say areas where the intensity values just change very, very little, if you just take a local neighborhood into account, and let's say you have one pixel which has the intensity value 100, one with 102, and one with 103, for example. You will map 100 to 0, 103 to 255, and 101 will stay in the middle. So you will, have, you will artificially over-amplify the contrast in areas where there is very little contrast in the first place. And so um, this causes issues or very strong artifacts of this um, over-amplification uh, of the contrast. And therefore, there's another extension which is called CLAE, Contrast Limited Adaptive Histogram Equalization, which basically is similar to the adaptive histogram equalization, but limits the, um, the contrast in increase that you're doing within your, um, especially within this rather homogeneous regions, um, so that this is a more advanced version which actually typically generates better results than the histogram equalization. So to give you a human a very good view what is actually going on in the image and even areas of low contrast um, will be amplified so you can see what's going on without avoiding this over amplification here of the results. Which brings me to the last um, example of such transformation which is noise variance equalization, which I want to talk about. So in order to understand why noise variance equalization makes sense or is useful, we need to dive a little bit deeper and take a small excursion towards the um, photon counts on my sensor. So um, every pixel on the chip of your camera is basically a photon counter. It counts a number of photons which reach that local area on your chip in a given time interval. And these are measurements, basically counts, but as we know, all sensors are noisy, so they are not perfect. And also, we have, um, we have a, a basically a, a, a flux of photons which reach my chip, and they are not 
coming. It's not a continuous function. There's something popping in and something popping out over here. So um, as a result of this, we need to take that flux of photons into account when we are obtaining or treating the measurements of intensity values for our individual images. So um, the first question is, what is a good model for modeling this from a statistical point of view? This effect that we have a constant flux of photons and um, kind of what's the amount of photons that reach a certain area in a given time frame. What we need to do is we need to, um, we need to model this and a good model for this is a Poisson distribution, um, which allows us to estimate how many photons what the probability distribution of photons, of number of photons, reaching that chip in a certain interval. And the, um, the variance of that Poisson distribution basically depends on how many photons are actually there. So it, we can basically see that the variance will increase in areas where there are a lot of photons coming in and will be smaller in areas where there's a small number of photons coming in. That means certain pixels have a higher um, variance of photon counts than uh, other regions. And this is bad because every pixel, based on its intensity value, um, has a different uh, uncertainty or different noise characteristics in here. Uh, and so we want to equalize this so that all pixels basically have a fixed value for the variance, which is useful if I do further image analysis techniques estimating the variance over here. So let's um, look a bit into the Poisson distribution um, because this is something that we will exploit here. So the, if you look to the definition of a Poisson distribution, um, it's a discrete probability distribution uh, that expresses the probability that a given number of events, here called the number k, occur within a fixed time interval or interval in space or even both time and space. Um, if we know the average rate of these events happening, and if um, the occurrence of an event is independent on when the previous event has, has occurred. And these are all things which actually fit pretty well to our photon example. So we have a photon flux, a stream of photons coming in from our light. So assuming during the exposure time, the flux of, constant, uh, the flux of photons, for example, is constant. So we have an average flow of photons. And the fact that one photon reaches the chip it's actually independent when that happens from when the previous photon hit um, actually my chip. So they are independent of each other and we have a known average rate, which is kind of our known average photon flux. And we want to estimate how many occurrences of the events do we have, so how many photons actually reach um, my sensor or my, my chip or my pixel. So the probability distribution over, let's say, one million photons hitting that cell is some parameter um, lambda, to the power of 1 million divided by the factorial of 1 million e to the power of minus this parameter value over here. Okay, so k is the number of photons, so is our input value, so there's one parameter, lambda, which actually sits over here, which impacts the shape of this Poisson distribution. So just for illustration purposes, I have plotted here the number of occurrences um, and different parameters for lambda, and we can see how the Poisson distribution looks like. So these are different variants of the Poisson distribution depending on this factor lambda, and this is the kind of the input occurrences. So what we can see over here, for la the larger the, the k, the more this function actually turns into a shape of a Gaussian distribution. So, um, and of course it also depends on your, on your lambda parameter over here, but typically we have extremely large number of, of occurrences of photons. We have very huge numbers of photons that are coming into our camera and reach our chip. So basically for large values, which are those which are relevant for us, actually this function will be similar or often similar to a Gaussian distribution. So the model that we will be using is the Poisson model and the lambda parameter can be specified, can be broken down as a product of two things. The first thing is the average number of incoming photons per second, so basically the flux of photons that is incoming that reaches the chip. So basically, um, on average, how many photons um, actually reach my chip. And T is the exposure time that we have over here. Because if you have longer exposure times, this effect will average out more compared to smaller exposure times. Because, of course, we have a 
variation in this photon flux is just kind of the average number of photons coming in here. Um, and then this distribution is a distribution about the number of photons that reach my sensor given my exposure time and given a certain photon flux, assuming this number of incoming photons per second is constant, so we have a constant lighting setup that we have over here. So um, if you look to the properties of the um, Poisson distribution, then the mean of um, incoming photons reaching my chip is beta times um, T, so the average photons coming in per second times the exposure time in seconds, and um, the variance is also beta times T. So that means the larger um, the exposure time or the, the, the larger the, the number of photons coming in per second, the higher the mean, that's clear, but also the higher the variance. So the, the more light is around, let's say I have a fixed exposure time, the more light is around, the larger that variance will actually be. And so then as a result of this, the standard deviation is beta times t over here. So this is the absolute standard deviation of variance in terms of the number of photons that actually reach my cell. If I look to the relative precision here, where I take the standard deviation divided by the mean over here, it looks different than this value actually gets smaller. So the relative precision gets, uh, get, gets, gets larger um, in the sense that um, I have more, less mistakes, less variation relative, the relation, sorry, um, for very bright areas, the variation of intensity values normalized by the number of photons that I actually have gets smaller. So there's a smaller variation for brighter pixels, but if I look to the absolute counts of photons, they actually get larger over here. So if you have the, the for as an example, this, let's say this is pixel number one and this is pixel number two. Um, on this pixel there is uh, very dark, there's not much light coming in, and here we have a pixel where a lot of light is coming in, then these variations of photons that reach, let's say I do a couple of images, and this is kind of the variations of photons that I count here and the variation of photons that I count here, we can see that the brighter areas will have a larger uh, variance in, in terms of counts rather than the dark areas over here. And this is the thing that we actually want to equalize out. So these variations should be identical. Note that in practice there are other sources of noise in your camera. The one is a, a constant noise term that typically comes from the electronics and the other one from the quantization so that you have just a certain number of intensity values that your camera will output. This adds a little bit of additional noise into that, but um, the, the varying noise term here, which is not constant, is basically the one that comes from this um, Poisson distribution model. And that's the one that we will actually look into or focus on in the remaining part. So um, we consider now a relationship between the variance and the intensity where we say this, uh, the, standard, the, the, the variance that we have over here is m times a um, of my input image. So this is kind of the, the, the variance depends on the uh, on the intensity values times some scale factor m. So the number of, basically says the number of photons um, is proportional to the variance that I have. My, but my goal is in my output histogram, I want to have a standard deviation which is constant, sigma zero for all intensity values. So it should be some constant. Okay, let's go back to our original um, relationship between the input and the output histogram and add an additional constraint to that. Okay, so what we are saying is the output from, from your standard variance propagation, we can say the output variance is the input variance times the first derivative of, um, of, that, of that transformation function f that I have, which is dB divided by dA, again, assuming a monotonously increasing function, right? Because we still want to keep the in, uh, intensity values as similar as they are. We don't want to compute the negative image and normalize it. So a monotonously increasing function is the assumption that we have in here. And this value over here, the first derivative of this function f times the standard deviation should be constant. So one of a constant variance, a constant standard deviation involved in here. And the standard deviation should be some value um, sigma zero. The important thing is that it's constant over here. 
Okay, now we can do again similar tricks that we used before. We have two equations. This is kind of the first equation that we have. And we have a second equation over here. The only difference to the examples that we used before is now that this is actually a quadratic function. Um, so we can rewrite this in a very easy way, moving dB to the other side. So basically multiplying with dA dividing by um, sigma A, which turns dB is sigma zero divided by sigma A times dA. And we have the standard deviation over here by just taking the square root of this example over here. So I can now put things together. I basically take this square root of MA, move it in here. So this will be my resulting equation, how I can rewrite it. And um, again, we do the same trick with the integration as we did before. So we can integrate this side, we can integrate this side. And here then the integral only sits up on this part because these two values are independent of A. That's kind of the trick that we can do in exactly the same way as we've done before. So this equation can be solved via integration. Again, I have my B sitting over here, which is equal to F of A. And then the integral over this part over here, again, sigma zero and square root of M are constant. I don't need to take them into account. If I integrate over this function over here, basically, a to the power of minus half turns into a to the power of 0.5. And um, so to compensate for this, I have the factor of two in front of it. So if I compute the first derivative of this term over here, I will actually exactly get up this term. And again, I have um, my uh, integration constant that sits over here. And this integration constant, I again need to um, exploit in some way or some constraint so that it holds. and so I want to choose them in a way that alpha and uh, so if A is 255, also B should be mapped to 255. So I'm actually fixing here um, the, 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 the fact that white pixels should stay white pixels. And then I can actually compute those parameters over here um, in, in this form. And then I actually obtain a mapping curve which looks like this. So this is actually a square root function because I have the square root of A in here. So I'm basically, I have some factors over here, some constant factors, and then the square root of intensity values. So this is a square root function, which takes the input values and maps it into these output values. So what this function actually does, it basically stretches the dark areas and squeezes together the bright areas. So Especially in this way, you can see dark areas are amplified. So dark pixels are mapped to a larger variety of output values. And over here, uh, the bright values will actually be compressed. But the important thing is that in the output image, we have now the same variance in terms of intensity um, values that we obtain for the individual pixels, which then can be advantages, for, uh, advantages if I analyze those images. So to sum up, um, we have presented here image histograms in the second part of this lecture, which are um, a representation for the distribution of intensity values of grayscale values, also color values that occur in an image. And we looked into different operators, so-called point operators, which then lead to this whatever transformation functions or tone curves, depending how you call them, that can be used now to manipulate images. So to map one image into an output image, and so the output image has certain properties. In the first part of the lecture, we used very simple linear functions, for example, to change brightness or to change contrast. And in the second part of the lecture here today, we looked into designing transformations so that the output image has certain properties or the histogram of the output image has certain properties. And we looked into histogram equalization, which basically means spreading the intensity values over the whole spectrum of possible values and noise variance equalization, where we actually want to turn the image into a new image where the um, the variance in the measured intensity values in the photon counts is equal for all pixels. And this basically um, exploits the fact that the underlying process is a Poisson distribution and then the, the variance and, uh, of the Poisson distribution grows with the number of events or with the number of photons arriving. And this is something that we exploited to compute a normalization or equalization of the image so that the variances are the same. With this, we are coming to the end of the lecture on image histograms, and um, I hope you get an idea that image histograms are useful, that we can do a lot of transformations with them, and there is a 
much larger number of possible transformations that we can do in order to make the image either look more beautiful, if you're more on the photography side, or that they have certain statistical properties or are good for being analyzed by a human if you are more on the image interpretation or photo photogrammetry side. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention and see you in the next lecture soon. Thank you.